Good evening. Welcome to the 168th of the Patriot Games uh, forums, uh, sponsored now by uh, the Huntington Progressive Coalition. It used to be the Long Island Progressive Coalition that sponsored it, but we've sort of, uh, what do we say, split off from that, so we have a little more uh, a wider range of topics that we can address and a little more freedom in what can be said here. Anyway, um, our forums are usually on the fourth Thursday of the month at 7 o'clock p.m. here or in the neighboring uh, large meeting room. And uh, But for this month uh, and for December, it's the third Thursday because of the holidays. So our next forum will be the 21st of December. Uh, tonight's topic is the Russian Revolution. And our speaker is Richard McLaughlin, who made a presentation on Mussolini several months ago that we very much enjoyed. I think you will enjoy what he has to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I think I can call this all you ever wanted to know about the Russian Revolution, but we're afraid to ask. Okay. The Russian Revolution, before I get into the revolution itself, we have to look at Russia, Tsarist Russia. From the western border with the German Empire to the Pacific Ocean, it was 6,000 miles wide or long. It covered 11 time zones. It stretched from the Arctic almost to the Indian uh, border. There are a hundred different languages were spoken. And it's a myriad of ethnic groups. If you take the western part of Russia going from the Crimea and heading north to the Baltic, uh, that was the area of Jewish settlement known as the Pale. You, the core of Russia where the Slavs lived, the Russians, the Ukrainians, and the Yellow Russians would be the area from Minsk up to Moscow, a little west of Moscow. There are also colonies of Germans. There were Baltic barons in uh, what is now Latvia and Estonia. There were Mennonites who were settled by Catherine the Great and the Steppes. And then there were a lot of German bourgeoisie businessmen scattered throughout Russia. Like for example, Leon Trotsky was educated at a German gymnasium in Odessa. So you have all these groups. Then you have uh, Mongols, for example. It's interesting, the most Western group of Buddhists in the world in 1914, let's say, was in Russia, just east of Rastafondan. They're known as Kalmuks, and they were descendants of uh, Mongolians. There was a civil war in Mongolia in the early 1700s. They were the losers, so they crossed the steppes and they settled in that area. The major religion in Russia before the, before the revolution was Russian Orthodoxy. Uh, you also had a large Roman Catholic population of Poles, and some of the Germans. There's also a very large Jewish population in the Pale. In fact, one of the ironies of Russian history is at one time in the Middle Ages, the Russian rulers would not allow Jews to settle in Russia. Then in the 18th century, the Polish Commonwealth is divided between the Russians, the Prussians, and the Austrians. And the Tsars now find themselves with the largest Jewish population in the world. So one of the ironies of history. There's also a very large Muslim population along the Volga and in Central Asia and in the Caucasus. There's also a fairly significant Armenian population. They're in the Caucasus, but they're all scattered throughout the towns and cities of Russia. They're part of the merchant class. So it's a very, it's a hodgepodge of people. The Tsars themselves, uh, the dynasty that ruled Russia at the time of the revolution of the Romanovs, they came to power in 1613 after the time of troubles. If you know anything about Russian history, this is a period when Boris Gutenhoff is around and there are false Dimitris and everything and there are bands roaming the countryside, killing people and there's famine. Uh, and so anyway, the boyars and nobles get together and they elect Michael Romanov because they think he's a weakling as czar. And anyway, the dynasty continues up until 1917. Uh, 
One of the other ironies of history is Karl Marx, of course, Lenin is a Marxist. Karl Marx stresses the industrial proletariat. Russia is a predominantly agrarian society. Only 2% of the population are involved in industry. And I'll get into it a little later on. This brings up some very interesting questions. How do you start a revolution successfully in Russia? So anyway, you have uh, autocracy. The czar rules by divine right. Uh, he, his word is law, is fiat. You can't contradict it. There's no parliament. So what happens is there's no way for discontent to be channeled. And what happens in the 19th century, you have a group of officers, they're called the Decembrists. These are men who had made it to uh, Paris defeating Napoleon. They had gone all the way from Russia right across Europe. And they were very impressed by what they saw in France, the idea of patriotism, parliaments, the rule of law. And they came back to Russia and in 1825, they started a rebellion. The ringleaders of the rebellion are executed and the rest of the Decembrists, these are all nobles and officers, are sent to Siberia. And this is the beginning of dissent in Russia, organized dissent. So then what happens is you get a group of people called Narodniks, and these are romantics, and they love the Russian peasant. They idealize the Russian peasant, and they go to live with the peasants. And what generally happens is the peasants don't like them. In some cases, they kill them. In other cases, they turn them over to the police. So anyway, the Narodniks do not like the czar, czar's government. So they engage in terrorism. In the 19th century, the typical picture of a Russian is somebody with a bowling ball with a lighted fuse, a terrorist. So they're romantics, and eventually, in 1901, they form a political party, the Socialist Revolutionaries, who actually are very democratic. Then in 1895, you have the formation of the Social Democrats. That's the party, and Lenin is one of the uh, founders of that party. He, a man by the name of Julius Martov and Alexei Plekhanov. They were the three men who founded it. And uh, in 1903, they have a big falling out. And you have two groups emerge from that, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. The Mensheviks are supposedly the minority, and the Bolsheviks are the majority. And how this comes about is over the question of what's a political party? And uh, Martov, says anybody can, who signs the petition is a member of the party. We want a mass party that's out in the open. And Lenin goes, no, we don't. We want a party of the elite, professional, full-time, well-disciplined revolutionaries who are intellectuals and know the Marxist canon. And so what happens is he's in the minority and Markov is in the majority. Then something happens at the, uh, the tips of the scales. There's a group called the Bund. These are predominantly Jewish members of the Social Democrats who are from the Pale area. And the question arises, are Jews a nationality? And uh, so what happens is the, whoever's chairing that particular question comes out and says, no, they're not. Because in order to be a nationality, you actually have to have a piece of land, a nation. And the Jews don't have that, so they're not a nation. So all the Bundists get up and walk out. Leon Trotsky was one of them at the time. So because they walk out, Martov and the Mensheviks are now the minority. And uh, Lenin claims his people uh, run the show. Anyway, uh, he gets involved in a revolution of 1905 and has to leave Russia. And he settles in um, Krakow, Poland, first of all. And then when the war breaks out, he's expelled and he settles in Geneva, Switzerland. Now, Lenin is a very interesting man because, they were, give you an example, he's a very flinty, hard guy. He's a professional revolutionary. He lives, eats, breathes, and sleeps revolution. Uh, throughout his exile, he lives like a monk. He lives in rooming houses. Uh, he's not ostentatious. He dresses plainly. He eats simply. Anyway, in, um, he's in Geneva. And he sees the war, and he thinks the war is, this is the interesting thing about being flinty. 
Most people would say, oh my God, it's horrible. A, a continent-wide war is broken out. He goes, no, this is good. This is going to help to overthrow the Tsar. And uh, earlier in 1894, there was a famine in the Volga, and 400,000 peasants starved to death. And uh, Lenin said, this is good. It shows the inefficiencies and deficiencies of the Tsar. This is going to help to overthrow them. His whole thing is overthrowing the Tsar. And he's going to establish paradise. This, this is the other interesting thing. He bases everything on Marx. And a man by the name of Chernyshevsky, who wrote a, a novel called What is to be Done. And Lenin will later write a treatise with the same title. And Chernyshevsky is talking about the ideal revolutionary. And like in one chapter in the book, there's this really incredibly beautiful girl. She falls in love with him and she tries to seduce him. He says, no, 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 I'm a professional revolutionary. I'll introduce you to somebody else. I have to stick with the revolution. And this becomes the, this is Lenin's ideal. This is how you have to be. So you get, okay, we're talking about Lenin. Now something about the Tsar, Nicholas II. Nicholas, at best, he was probably a nice man. He was a family man. Uh, he was patriotic, he was religious, but he was a mediocrity. Uh, gov running, running the country was just beyond him. And uh, at the time he took the throne, the monarchy is already undergoing a loss of prestige. Uh, it starts in 1854 with the Crimean War. The Crimean War is fought in Russia. The Russians lose. It's humili humiliating. It's embarrassing. Then they get involved in um, a war with Turkey in the Balkans. And this causes our uh, Bulgaria to become a free country. And the Russians are marching towards Constantinople, or as they call it, Tsarograd. And the British fleet appears in the Narrows off Constantinople. Yes? Yes, yes, that's it. And the, so the fleet comes off, so now the Tsar has to go to a congress in Berlin, and they tell him, you can't go to Constantinople. It's humiliating, it's embarrassing. Then in 1904, Russia gets involved in the Russo-Japanese War, and uh, people are telling Nicholas, don't do this, don't get involved. And other people say, ah, they're monkeys, you can beat them hands down. So anyway, Russia gets involved in a war. It starts over the question of who has authority in Korea. And uh, the Russians are moving in there and the Japanese are saying, this is our territory, this is our sphere of influence. And the Japanese make a couple of protests to the Russians. The Russian government ignores them. So the Japanese then, with torpedo boats, attack Port Arthur, which was a uh, Russian naval base on the coast of China. And they sink the Russian fleet, that's an anchor there, and they lay siege. A siege lasts a year, and after a year, the garrison finally has to surrender. Meantime, the Russian Navy, the Baltic Fleet, sails from St. Petersburg through the Baltic into uh, the English Channel around Africa to uh, beat the Japanese. And anyway, on the way over, they almost wind up in a war with England. They're in the English Channel, and it's foggy. And they think the Japanese fleet is there to attack them. So they sink a couple of boats. It turns out they're English fishing boats. So England is not very happy about that. Anyway, they, get, they finally make it to the Tsushima Straits, which are between Korea and uh, Japan. And they're decimated. 8,000 Russian officers and enlisted men are killed in the battle. The Russian fleet is destroyed. And right after this, revolutions, uh, rather, a revolution breaks out in Russia. And uh, it's put down very bloodily. And one of the things the Tsar has to do is establish a parliament of sorts. It's called the Duma. And it has very, very, very limited authority. This is one of the things that happens with the Tsars in the 19th century. They'll grant some sort of privilege and then rescind it. So the Duma has very, very little power. Anyway, after the war with Japan, many advisors tell Nicholas, Russia cannot afford to get involved in a war. We don't have the wherewithal. There's going to be a revolution, and the regime is going to be overthrown. And uh, for a couple of years, things go along very well. Then 1914 comes along. At this time, Russia is allied to France. And the French buy a lot of Russian bonds. 
from about 1890 up to 1914, uh, Russians are building railroads all over the country. And it's mostly French money that's subsidizing them. So the French basically say, hey, look, it, we owe, you go, if you don't help us, we're going to see to it that you're never going to be able to raise, float any more money for bonds. So Nicholas gets involved in the war. And everybody is looking at what is called the Russian steamroller. The Russians are just going to come and they're going to run over the Germans. And the general who's in charge of the German army in East Prussia has a nervous breakdown at the thought of this Russian juggernaut coming along. So there's General von Ludendorff and General von Hindenburg are sent. Hindenburg's an old man now. He's taken out of retirement. And they do what is called a cane tactic. And this goes back to the Punic Wars between the Romans and the Carthaginians. They managed, they, the Russians are so primitive, all their messages are done by telegraph. So the Germans tap in, and they know all the Russian dispositions. So you have uh, Surinov, is the general who's in the front, and there's another man named Renenkampf, and his soldiers are scattered out for about 30 or 40 miles. So he has to stop and regroup and resupply. So there's a gap between him and Surinov, and the Germans surround Surinov's army and kill 70,000 Russians and capture an additional 100,000. And then they push Renenkampf back. And this is a real blow. So Nicholas now, and this is his biggest mistake, takes command of the army. Now he's responsible for anything that happens. It would have been better off to leave it to the generals. And he goes to the general staff. And the, the Duma, members of the Duma start complaining. And they say there's incompetence and there's treason. And it's in the royal family. Alexandra, the wife of Nicholas II, is a German. Actually, personally, she disliked Wilhelm II because his dynasty, the Hohenzollerns, had uh, kicked her family out of Hesse. She was from Hesse in Germany, the state of Hesse. But anyway, she's considered a German. And to make matters worse, there's this man by the name of Rasputin. Sometimes he's called a monk. He's not a monk, he's not a staritz. He is a peasant from Siberia who belong to a sect of people who are known as antinomians. Anybody here know what an antinomian is? The only people who are going to be saved are sinners. So you have to sin. So what's the best way of sinning? Orgies. <laughs> so he belongs to a group like that. Anyway, he makes it to Moscow, or rather to, to Leningrad, St. Petersburg. And the Tsar has a son. He has four daughters and one son. And his son has hemophilia. And he gets incredible pains in the joints. Excruciating pain. Rasputin somehow knows how to assuage that. And there's a recent biography that's come out on Rasputin, and apparently this is true. Whatever technique he had, he could do that. So the Tsar and Tsarina really feel indebted to him. So he now gets in the position where he starts naming ministers of state and bishops. And so a lot of people are really, really, really uh, upset about this. And in 1916, a group of aristocrats, including one of Nicholas's uh, nephews, get Rasputin, they, they lure him somewhere, they feed him uh, drinks and uh, pastries that are laced with arsenic. Doesn't work. So they have to shoot him. And they finally kill him. They wrap him up in a, in a uh, rug, and they dump him in one of the canals in St. Petersburg. And uh, the Tsar's, uh, right now, his prestige is very, very, very low. As the war goes on, the infrastructure of Russia starts to break down. Uh, the railway system starts to break down. Because of all the men in the armed forces, agriculture retracts. So there are food problems develop in St. Petersburg. And there is a rebellion, a mutiny. And the Tsar is at General Staff Headquarters. He, and uh, one of his generals says, we can take care of this, don't worry. They couldn't. So eventually, a couple of generals and some members of the Duma prevail upon him to abdicate. And he does. And when he abdicates, he also 
dissolves the Duma. So two things pop up to take its place. One is called the provisional government. That's under the name Prince Lvov. And the other is the Soviet. Now, a Soviet is a council or a group. The Bolsheviks later capture this name and use it for themselves. These are separate, distinct from the Bolsheviks initially. So they now are running the show. And the first thing that the Soviets do, they're made up of uh, factory workers and members of the armed forces. Uh, every fi 500 people could elect one representative to the Petrograd Soviet. And the first thing they do is they issue what's called order number one. And under that, the soldiers in the army at the front can get together, elect councils, and decide how things are going to be done. They don't have to listen to the officers except in strictly military things. But what happens is everything breaks down. So when the Tsar abdicates, this catches everybody by surprise. Lenin is in Geneva at the time. He's there with Zinoviev. Zinoviev who's also He's going to be later on, he's going to be liquidated by Stalin. They're both in Geneva. The German general staff talks to some radicals who say, hey, bring this guy, send this guy back to Russia. He'll cause the uh, fighting spirit to collapse. Now, this is at a time, 1917, the Germans have suffered tremendous losses in the war. They're fighting a two front war. They're on the Western Front, they have soldiers on the Russian Front. America is about to enter the war. And they know that once America comes in, it's going to tip the scales if the status quo is maintained. So if they can knock Russia out, they can take all the troops who are in Russia, send them to the Western Front, and they can defeat the Allies. So they put Lenin and about 50 other people uh, get into a train. It's called a sealed train. It wasn't. It made stops at various places in Germany. But the trick was is to make it look like Lenin had no contact with the Germans. Because if he did, then his enemies in Russia could say, you're a traitor, you've committed treason. So they maintained this pretense that he didn't. So he goes to Finland Station, and he gets off the train, and there's a big crowd to meet him. And they're there basically because they were promised drinks. This is one of the things about the Bolsheviks. They're very good at staging things, using propaganda. So. You now have Lenin and his followers, and you have Alexander Kerensky, who takes over the uh, provisional government. And he's a socialist, and it's interesting. He's from Sambirsk, which is a town on the Volga River, the same town that Lenin was from. And in 1886, Lenin's older brother was in with a group of people who tried to assassinate Alexander III, the Tsar. They were unsuccessful but they were arrested and he was hanged. And the family, the Lenin's family, the Ulyanovs, were now in disgrace. Nobody would go near them. They were, except for one man, Alexander Kerensky's father, who was a uh, school superintendent, would be the best way to describe it. And uh, he wrote a letter of recommendation that got Lenin into college. Nobody would accept Lenin to college until this letter had been written. This is one of the ironies of the Russian Revolution. Uh, Alexander Kerensky was about 10 years younger than Lenin and probably had never met him face to face. Or if he did, he wouldn't have talked. There would have been, wouldn't have been any reason to. So Lenin then goes to uh, university. He's kicked out after a year because he's now involved with the radical movement. And uh, this is another fascinating thing about uh, uh, revolutionaries. Lenin's father was a member of the nobility, um, nobility of service. He was also uh, involved in education. And at one point, Lenin's mother buys an estate. She goes, we're gonna have you become a country squire. And he runs it for three years and the peasants rob him blind and he runs up a gigantic debt and gets out of that. And he then studies for the bar and it, in Russia at that time, it's a four-year course. He does it in a year, and he passes the bar, and he practices law for about nine years. Then the revolution comes, now he's back. One of the people who joins him from the Bronx was Leon Trotsky. 
Leon Trotsky uh, is also middle class. His father is a Jewish farmer in the Pale, uh, near Odessa. And he had a 250 acre farm that he owned outright, and he rented another 500 acres of land. Very, very prosperous. And Trotsky was sent to uh, a German gymnasium. Finishes that, and then uh, as far as higher education, because he's a radical, that's out. So before these people come to Russia, there's a big question. This goes back to Karl Marx. Karl Marx, like today, we're, I think the uh, things that people are preoccupied with excessively is sex. The radicals, it's economics. Everything is economic. Karl Marx uh, lived in Germany, and he had taken part in the revolution of 1848. And he had to flee after that. He lived in the Rhineland, he had to flee. And he moved to England. And he spent a lot of time in the British Library reading parliamentary blue books. In the 19th century, there's a period in England when uh, the Industrial Revolution has started. And there's all sorts of problems. So Parliament does studies. Uh, and they're very objective, statistics on you know, sanitation, disease, uh, hospital care, education. And uh, anyway, Marx goes through all these. And that's the basis of Capital, his major work. It's originally written in German. For, for the first five years of its existence, it sells a thousand copies in Germany. A, copy is, a couple of copies are sent to Russia. Now Russia has a very strict system of censorship. Any book that comes into Russia has to be viewed by censors and approved for it to get to the general public. And if it's not, if it's a forbidden book and you're caught with one, you can go to Siberia. So anyway, the, the censors, there are two censors, they look at uh, Capital and they say, nobody's gonna read this, very few people are gonna read this. And most of the ones who read it aren't going to understand it. Ah, it's harmless, let it in. So in the first year of its existence in Russia, they sell 3,000 copies in one year as opposed to 1,000 copies in five years in Germany. Okay, so... It's in German or translated to Russian? It's in, uh, well, it's translated to Russian eventually. I think originally the original copies are going to German. You have to realize most everybody in Russia who had an education at that time uh, German would have been a second language. No French? That would have been the aristocracy. The aristocracy, definitely French. In fact, uh, it's probably very late in the 19th century that members of the aristocracy start learning Russian. You know, it's, it's uh, one of the ironies. So anyway, one of the things that Marx, talk, Marx talks about is uh, base superstructure. If you look at anything, any society, Pago Pago, Tibet, New York City, Who's making the money? Who has the wealth? And this is going to determine, the rest of society is going to determine art, literature, everything like that. First thing he says, that's the, one of the bases. The other one is the dialectic. And he goes, history goes through three stages. We start off with a society that's based on slavery. And then you have, you know, this thesis and antithesis and they meet and the synthesis is now feudalism. Okay, and then from feudalism, we go to capitalism. And Marx is, he praises capitalism. He says it's dynamic, it's innovative. Look at what it's done to the world, how it's changed the world. But one of the things it does is he talks about something called surplus value. Let's say you take a piece of clay and you shape it, you make it into a vase, and you sell it. Maybe the clay by itself is worth 50, you got a pound of clay, it's worth 50 cents. You make a vase, you now sell it for five dollars. That four hundred and the four dollar and fifty cents difference. Well, Marx says a capitalist will try to get as much of that as he can, and a worker will get as little as possible. And what happens eventually, you have what they call the inner contradictions of capitalism. Profits go up, but at the same time things become tougher and tougher, and competition becomes more and more fierce and severe. And eventually what happens is there's a breakdown. And that's when the proletariat, the worker, who has no uh, tools of his own, is going to be able to triumph. He's exploited. And because he's exploited, he's virtuous. And he's going to lead humanity into the new world. There's going to be a world where uh, everybody will be equal. There will be no private property. 
you know, the golden age. So then the question comes up, hey, what about Russia? 2% of the population work in industry. This isn't relevant to us. And this is what more moderate Marxists will say. We have to have a bourgeoisie revolution before we can have a proletarian revolution. Now, Lenin goes, and this is based on something Trotsky comes up with. No, that's not necessarily true. We have a very small industrial proletariat, but they're concentrated. They're just in a few areas of Russia. They're packed together. Like there's the uh, uh, big plant in um, St. Petersburg. It was the largest factory in Europe in 1914. You must have had 30, 40,000 workers there. So this is what Lenin is looking at. And these are going to be the vanguard. What happens is to workers too, he talk, uh, Marx talks about, here you are before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you want to make a chair, you make the chair all by yourself. You get the wood, you shape it, you, you, you carve it, you know, you put covering on it and everything like that, the completed product. The Industrial Revolution comes along now, and you make the widgets that fit on the bottom of the legs. Somebody else makes the legs. Somebody else makes the back. Somebody else makes the textile covering. <laughs> so what happens is the worker now becomes alienated. And if, if the alienation really sets in, he also becomes class conscious. This is the important thing, class struggle. He gets consciousness. And Lenin will talk about false consciousness. The, the, the two terms that Lenin uses uh, terms of opprobrium. The first one is petty bourgeoisie. The other one is white guardist. And uh, so if you're a worker and uh, somebody comes along and says, we've got a labor union. Join the labor union. You'll see you, you know, your hourly wages are going to go up by 5% next year if you're in the union. Lenin would say, that's meliorism. That's terrible. You've just become petty bourgeoisie. You're no longer a member of the proletariat. So anyway, when he gets to St. Petersburg, uh, Lenin is like a, a superb tactician, probably one of the best tacticians ever. He uses three words that really strike a chord. Bread, peace, and land. And this is a time now, you know, the transportation is broken down, so food is becoming scarce in St. Petersburg. Okay, peace. The provisional government stays in the war after the uh, czar steps down. So Lenin says, we'll get out of the war. What he wants to do is, instead of having an international war, he wants to have a civil war. It's his hope that he's going to start a revolution in Russia, and this is going to catch fire and spread out over the rest of the Western world. And so the proletariat will then be able to fight the capitalist and bourgeoisie. So you get to the storming of the Winter Palace, which is the October Revolution. Has anybody here ever seen Sergei Eisenstein's movie? Yes. Damn days that shook the world. Yeah. Ain't, ain't how it happened. <laughs> Did you ever see that movie? Yeah. Uh, what really happens is um, it was chaos. Kerensky's people are in the Winter Palace. This is his cabinet. And they're guarded by a group of cadets, uh, invalids, soldiers who've been uh, wounded at the front, and a small contingent of women soldiers. And uh, the Bolsheviks and surround the palace. But not, not, it's not a tight blockade because like the cadets go out and leave and go to lunch, don't come back. Kerensky leaves. And uh, it's very interesting. This is one of the things about the chaos of the revolution. He leaves and he's trying to get a, a vehicle, a car. The British Council will not give him one. The American Council does. And, and this is, and, and Kerensky talks about this in his uh, biography, about the autobiography, the revolution. He's driving out and there's a sign on a wall, a graffito, down with the Jew Kerensky, long live Trotsky. <laughs> So anyway, he leaves, and he's supposed to get soldiers who are going to come back and defeat the Bolsheviks. But there's one problem about, this is October now, in July, there was a general by the name of Kornilov who was made chief of staff by Kerensky. And this man is a, a Siberian Cossack. 
and he's a real tough guy. And what he wants to do is he wants to restore discipline among the troops, break up these uh, Soviets, these uh, soldiers' councils, get back to strict discipline, fight the war. And um, Kerensky is of two minds about them, and he's sort of afraid of them. He thinks see, everybody who's involved in the Russian Revolution knows all about the French Revolution. And what happens at the end of the French Revolution? Who comes along at the very end? Napoleon. So Bonapartism. This is something that has uh, socialists, and Kerensky's a socialist, afraid. So at one point, there's a misunderstanding. And Kornilov sends troops. They're going to go into uh, St. Petersburg and disarm some of the radicals. But they're stopped. They don't make it all the way. Kerensky, when he hears this, is petrified. He then suspends Kornilov and arrests him. So what happens as a result of this is the army wants nothing to do with Kerensky. So when Kerensky goes driving out in the countryside, the American sedan, everybody says, That's, it's your problem. We're not going to get involved. So the Bolsheviks basically walk into the Winter Palace and take over. Most people in St. Petersburg don't even know it's happened. You have troops walking down the street, and you have theater goers coming home, passing each other. So Lenin is now in charge. In fact, to show you how bad things were, at one point, uh, before the, uh, they assaulted the Winter Palace, there was supposed to be a red lantern raised on the flagpole in the Peter and Paul Fortress, which was up high and overlooked the Winter Palace. They couldn't find one. And the man who was sent out to find one fell into a swamp. <laughs> uh, this is the chaos, so it's, you know, it's amazing that Lenin's people were as successful as they were. So, okay, so Lenin now takes over, and first thing he does is he says, okay, we're going to nationalize everything. So, uh, banks, businesses, everything are nationalized. A uh, month after he takes office, he establishes the Cheka, the secret police. And what they do, they go out and they get hostages. They're like, for example, if somebody will say bourgeoisie. They'll go out and they'll capture 200 people who are bourgeoisie, and put them in prison. Czarist, they'll go out and they'll get former ministers and officials in the czarist government, imprison them. At one point, there is a uh, girl, uh, Fanya Kaplan. She belongs to the Socialist Revolutionary Party, the left wing of it. She tries to assassinate Lenin. She shoots him, hits him uh, two times. She's captured. The Cheka has her for four days. They torture her to find out if she has any accomplices. And she refuses to name anybody. She's a professional revolutionary. She'd already spent over 10 years in prison in very tough circumstances. She was, so she's then taken out and shot. The Cheka now takes out about 400 people in St. Petersburg and shoots them. This is the Red Terror. And I mentioned before, the uh, Bolsheviks are very cognizant of the French Revolution. So if you look at a real quick uh, recapitulation of the French Revolution. The French Revolution starts because Louis XVI, the king, calls the Estates General because he's bankrupt. The, the French government has no money. So they get together, and these are basically moderates. And they start off, they go to Notre Dame, there's a solemn high mass by the Archbishop, celebrated by the Archbishop of Paris. They meet. Gradually, radicals who've been very influenced by the Enlightenment take over. And they want to create a new virtuous republic. And what happens eventually is Louis and his wife are both guillotined. And so this starts all the monarchs of Europe now combine and declare war on France. And two things happen, French response. One, they establish a mass levy. Anybody between the age of such and such and such and such is now in the army. They send them out to prevent the kings from conquering France. The other thing is Jacobins take over and they start a terror. That's when people get the guillotine. Now the French terror, the revolutionary terror in France, lasts a year. The Bolshevik terror <laughs> lasts from 1917 to about 1953. And when it first starts, 
after the Tsar is killed, a civil war breaks out in Russia. So the Bolsheviks say, these are extraordinary circumstances, and we have to take extraordinary measures. We need the terror. This is what the French did in the revolution. We have to do it here. And they also establish uh, gulags, concentration camps. And uh, the first concentration camp is at Soloviki in the White Sea. It's a monastery. They kill some of the monks and put the rest of them in as inmates in the camp. And to show you how crazy things are at this time, there's a man who is a student at the University of uh, Petrograd. It's now Petrograd. Um, and he belongs to a group of people who are like, they're literary enthusiasts. And they have nicknames for each other. And the Cheka finds out about this and thinks it's a conspiracy. It's an anti-Bolshevik conspiracy. So this individual is among many students who get arrested. And at this time, your family could visit you in the gulag. That changes under Stalin, that, that's out. But, so this man's family come to visit, and I think they're there for two or three days. While they're visiting, he learns that he's on a list of 100 people who are gonna be shot. So he hides, and he takes somebody else in his place, and 100 people are shot. And he eventually goes back to his barracks when his family says, oh, we got 100 people, it's okay, relax. Arbitrary and capricious. And this is one of the things about Soviet life. Uh, the innocent were just as prone as the guilty to be taken out and shot. So you have the secret police. They also target the Russian Orthodox Church. And uh, they seize icons, vessels, and everything like that to sell in the West. One of the reasons for this is a famine breaks out. The Bolsheviks send out expeditionary forces into the countryside to seize grain from peasants. And sometimes they take everything. There's nothing left to plant used for the next season. So what happens is peasants begin to grow less and less. And it's a vicious cycle. Uh, a famine breaks out in the Volga. Eventually three million people are gonna die in it. And the world finds out about this. Uh, so what happens is, uh, Herbert Hoover, who will become president of the United States, is one of the people who goes over and brings American food to uh, save the people. But what the Bolshevik government does, it, it seizes the goods of the church and says, we, we need these for famine relief. And the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church says, fine, we'll even give you money. You, you let us keep these vessels, but we'll give you the equivalent amount of money. No, 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 no. Uh, try, uh, Lenin was using this as an excuse to break the back of the church. So who gets the job of selling off the icons and precious goods, Leon Trotsky. So you have a situation where the chief rabbi of Moscow says one day, you know, uh, Trotsky does all these things and Bernstein gets it in the neck. You know, it, it, it helps to create an aura of anti-Semitism. So you have the church, now a number of people, uh, like for example, Bishop Benjamin of Petrograd uh, he defied the Soviets, and he held, uh, oh, you'd have big demonstrations of Orthodox Christians. They'd have uh, parades and marches. So he's taken out with a number of his priests and lay people. They're tried and shot, 1920. So the Civil War is going on now. It's all over. It's, you have an army in the uh, Baltic states. You have an army in Siberia. You have an army down in the area of uh, the Crimea. 1921, finally, this is all over. It ends. What are the two sides of the Civil War? There's three sides. Three sides. Okay. okay, you have the reds, the whites, and in the middle you got the greens. <laughs> uh, what happens is uh, the whites, this is an interesting thing too, uh, a lot of these people are former czarist officers and generals or soldiers in the czarist army. Um, you also have socialist revolutionaries and some of the white forces as well. Uh, the Reds would be the Bolsheviks. The peasants are in the middle. Their attitude is a bomb on both your houses. Leave us alone. We just want the land. We just want to grow our crops. So uh, in the Ukraine, Ukraine it starts originally, there's a movement called the Greens. And they tie down the Bolsheviks for quite a while. They're eventually broken. So anyway, the Civil War ends. The emergency measures don't. You still have armed parties going out to the countryside requisitioning food. Hostages are taken. 
If a certain amount of food is uh, given in a certain village, people will be taken out and shot. So what happens is uh, hunger once again sets in. And this is especially true in a place like St. Petersburg that's re far removed from agricultural areas. You just can't go to the suburbs and pick up food. So you now have unrest among factory workers and you have unrest among the sailors of the Baltic fleet. And they're at a place called Kronstadt. That's 20 miles outside of uh, Petrograd. And they're the darlings, the jewels of the revolution. They helped uh, in the uh, overthrow of the uh, Kerensky government. And um, most of them come from Ukraine, from that area, southern Russia. So you have, so, and they're also young. The average age is 23. And unlike soldiers, most sailors could read. You're on a vessel that's operated by steam, it's moving parts. You have to be able to read instructions. So they're very, very, very left wing and they're totally disillusioned with the Bolsheviks. So they rise up and uh, they establish a Soviet in Kronstadt. And they make a list of demands. Let me see here, give you some. Uh, freedom of assembly, free speech, free press. Uh, people who are leftist revolutionaries who are Bolshevik prisons should be released. Lenin will not negotiate. He calls these people, he says, these are the tools of white guardists. They're reactionaries. They're no longer members of the revolution. So Leon Trotsky and a general by the name of Tukashevsky are sent out to assault Kronstadt. And uh, Kronstadt is sort of on an island and it's surrounded by water. And when they do the siege, when they go out, it's uh, frozen over. So they have 50,000 uh, Bolshevik soldiers go against 17,000 sailors. And very, very, very difficult, severe, rough fighting. And they eventually overwhelm the garrison. And they take all the leaders and they're summarily shot. And everybody else is sent to a gulag in the north, you know, up near the Arctic. You're not going to last long up there. If you don't die of hypothermia, you'll die of pneumonia. And a small group are able to break out and make it to Finland, which at that time is very close to Russia. The borders change under Stalin, but at that time, it's still fairly close. They get over. Now, these are people who were the backbone of the revolution. At the same time, an uprising breaks out among the peasants of Russia. And one of the most uh, severe uh, outbreaks is in Tambov province. That's about 200. 50 miles south, southeast of Moscow. And the peasants there had supported the Reds during the Civil War. And because of the exactions of grain and everything like that, they now rebel. So General Tukashevsky is sent down. And he establishes camps. And women and children are herded into these camps. And poison gas is used against the men. And he eventually breaks the back of this. By the way, Tukashevsky is shot in 1937 by Stalin. It's one of the good things Stalin does. He gets rid of a lot of these murderers. But anyway, uh, so now you also have something going on in Russia called war communism. Uh, this is a, a, an idea of uh, Leon Trotsky. Uh, everybody in a particular industry would get together and they're going to raise the gross national product. And within six months, socialism is going to be realized. And what happens is they establish a bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy just chokes everything, and everything collapses. Uh, Trotsky uh, does away with money, because that's something that only the bourgeoisie have. You don't need money. And uh, an inflation is, is started. The government starts printing money. So what happens is, food stops coming into St. Petersburg. Workers now rebel. Workers in factories that had supported the Bolsheviks initially. So how do you respond to that? What do you do? You go in, you get the leaders, and you shoot them, you grab a bunch of others and you put them in camps. And you cow everybody else. And that goes on and on and on and on. So one of the things uh, I think it's very interesting about Lenin is uh, for a long time, He's pictured as a, a humanist, a very humane man. And uh, Stalin is the aberration. And in reality, Stalin 
steps into a system that's already been established. Uh, revolutionary tribunals take the place of courts. And uh, people who bring you in to prosecute you, they determine whether you're guilty or innocent. They determine, their language determines whether you are or you aren't. You're, you're totally in the dark. So anyway, here's Stalin. He's interesting because he is probably one of the few proletarians involved in, with the early Bolsheviks. He's an ethnic Georgian. That's in the Caucasus. It's, it's not in the American South. And uh, he studied to be, he, he was a seminarian at Tiflis Theological Seminary. And uh, he was studying to be an Orthodox priest. And uh, he knew Georgian, that's his native language. He knew Russian, which he spoke terribly. If people I know have heard him, they say his Russian was horrible. But he could speak it, and he could read it. He read all the Russian classics. He knew classical Greek. And he also knew Church Slavonic, which is different. Uh, Church Slavonic is equivalent to Old Bulgarian. It's not the same as modern Russian. Modern Russian wouldn't understand most of it. And it's in a different alphabet. So he knew four languages with four different alphabets. Um, and he is uh, very approachable. You know, like a party of uh, factory workers could come into, into Moscow and Stalin would see them, oh, what's your problem? Oh, let me see what I can do about solving that. Trotsky, on the other hand, who's his main rival, was very, very arrogant. Uh, when in the Kremlin, when uh, members of the party hierarchy would have a party, Trotsky would have to go when he'd say something like, how's the weather? And after he answered the question, they said, fine, oh, okay, good, and good night, and he'd leave. Uh, these people bored him. Uh, he, he, he couldn't deal with them. Whereas Stalin was very affable. And Stalin is uh, made secretary general of the Communist Party. Now, according to, supposedly there are letters, uh, Lenin's testament. And Lenin supposedly said, this guy's a no good Nick. He should go nowhere. Chances are those letters are forgeries. Uh, there's a man by the name of Stephen Kotkin who's writing a three volume uh, life of Stalin. And uh, he's been in the archives. I mean, his uh, volume two has just come out. It's this thick, and the footnotes are like incredible. Wow, they're incredible. You get a nosebleed looking at them. Yeah. And he claims uh, it's not true. The other thing was on three occasions, Stalin said, I'm going to resign. No, 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 you can't resign. One of the things about Stalin was he was very intelligent, he had an incredible memory, and he was very, very, very hard working. And this is something, this was a characteristic that stayed with him right up until 1953 when he died. He could put in a 12 or 14 hour day if necessary. And uh, he was indispensable. So what happens is there's a, a power play and he wins. Trotsky is exiled. He eventually is able to leave Russia and he goes to Mexico. And in 1940, he gets a nice pick in the head. Uh, one of Stalin's assassins did that. Zinoviev, who had come to Russia with Lenin on the train, he's shot. Kamenev is shot. Uh, Tukhachevsky is shot. Bukharin, who is called the darling of the revolution, uh, Lenin's favorite, Lenin, the apple of Lenin's eye, he's shot. All the old Bolsheviks, basically, are shot between 1936 and 1941. Most of them are shot in 1936-37. A couple of people are kept in prison longer than that. But Stalin picks up an infrastructure that had already been created by Lenin. And so the question is, an interesting question is, what does this have to do with us today? Here we are in Huntington. What, what does the Bolshevik Revolution have to do with us? A lot. One of the things that the Bolsheviks posed was a threat to our way of life. And that's one of the reasons why various pension plans and things like that were invented in the United States and why you have a welfare state in Western Europe. That was to keep the Bolsheviks at bay. They were sort of the wolf at the door. And it's very interesting. I mean, I don't know if you could say cause and effect. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, a little while after, a lot of these things start disappearing. You know, you don't like this game? Go to hell. Where are you going to go? We're the only game in town now. So there we are. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
Any questions? Uh, the question I have is the um, dichotomy of this nice boy going for religious to a religious seminary, supposedly, and then becoming the killer. Uh, so we're talking about stop. So what happened in between that turned him from being somebody who was who was supposedly God faring, whatever his religion was, to becoming uh, anti religious completely and being able to, to order the, the slaying of all of his enemies? Well, he was expelled from the seminary. And supposedly, supposedly it was for reading forbidden books. But I know somebody who is the son, who knows the son of somebody who was on the faculty when he was expelled. It was a pornography. <laughs> anyway, he was, he was kicked out. Um, <laughs> but it's a question of, you don't go into a seminary without, be, without being an idealist, uh, of thinking no. that you're going to change the world, I think. But what happens is, uh, here he is, He's, his father's a cobbler, his father was a drunk, his father used to beat him, he used to beat his mother. And he's in, he, he lives in a corner of the Russian Empire, an obscure corner. Uh, he gets a good education there, utilitarian. Uh, it's interesting, they say he had a beautiful voice, and he'd, he'd sing in the church choir, and he'd like to do that. And uh, supposedly, and this happened, to, oh, what's going on right up until the time of his death, uh, a couple of times a week, he would go into one of the cathedrals inside the Kremlin. He'd spend 15 minutes to a half an hour alone. Mm -hmm. And there's the story, there's the daughter tells, uh, when she was in school, the teacher said, Jesus never existed. And she came home, and she told that to Stalin, and Stalin said, let me sit you down and tell you the story. The teacher's wrong on everything, but uh, when he was younger, he was very, very affable. He was like, he was a poet. He had a couple of volumes of Georgian poetry published. He was a womanizer. He liked to have parties, he liked to drink. That's something that continued on us when he came into the Kremlin. They, uh, what apparently changes everything is around 1937, he makes a speech, no, earlier, 29, he makes a speech to the Supreme Soviet, and he says, Russia has to industrialize. The Swedes beat us, the Germans beat us, the Japanese beat us. Unless we advance in 10 years, we're finished. This is the beginning of the five-year plan. And there are a lot of communists who are really, people at the top, who really fight this. There are a lot of fights that go on inside the uh, party. In fact, there are people who want to have him removed from office. And he eventually prevails, and he's, uh, his wife at the time thought that what was going on was too extreme. And she committed suicide. Uh, she shot herself. And they say that Stalin's personality changed after that. He got to be very morose and very standoffish. And when he would be with a group of people in the Kremlin, when he would have a meeting, and they would be discussing things, he'd have a pad in front of him, and he'd be drawing wolves on it. Yes? Okay. <clears throat> My understanding of revolution is very minimal. I have seen the movie, Sergei Eisenstein, 10 Days That Shook the World, which you disapprove as being not as very trouble. Uh, the second is Zbigniew Brzezinski's book, Grand Failure, which he describes this in detail. And then two weeks of a tour of Russia, uh, Soviet Union in 1987. So this is very minimal, but I'll give you two anecdotes and one question at the end. <clears throat> the first anecdote is, once I was crossing from Finland, you know, into St. Petersburg. <clears throat> this big, you know, uh, Russian uh, custom officer, since I have a name which sounds Russian and have the beard, she said, Petrovich, do you have a Bible? So that proves that 30 years ago, you know, they still are afraid more of the Bible and religion, you know, um, religion is opiate of the masses, then the drugs or guns. They don't ask about that. Only do you have a Bible. So that's something which shocked me. I said, I don't have a Bible. I mean, <laughs> leave me alone. So that's the first thing. 
the second one is the no what's the second one <laughs> my my grandfather was a hunter and he was a gun collector one of his precious you know items was the uh, i think i mean the 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 production is the colt you know colt colt which is a huge 45 with with the with the, uh, the the trigger is protected with a little uh, uh, you know guard in here and one for the for the fourth finger that you can draw fast you know which I have never seen this anywhere else but you know and what was interesting about this humongous you know uh, 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 revolvers is that it said Pierva Oruzionea Fabrica America. Which is the first American um, uh, factory of the of the arms, which was obviously some kind of a, you know, World War One support of Americans and to supply something that they provided for the Russians. You know, that's you know the humongous. Uh, for, unfortunately, my mother threw it away. You know, because she was afraid that I will do something wrong with it. And then I have a question for you. Why did they change the, the, the name of Petrovgrad uh, into St. Petersburg? If they hate religion, what was so saint about this Petrovgrad? Well, Why did they change it? St. Petersburg sounds German. Yeah. And they're at war with Germany. Yeah. So it's like the uh, House of Hanover, the English royal family. They yeah. become the Windsors or Lord Battenberg becomes Lord Montbart. Yeah. You get rid of the German name, you get something else that's more neutral. So that's why they go over to Petrograd. Yeah, yeah, but uh, then change it then later on into say St. Uh, uh, Petersburg. O originally it's St. Petersburg. Yeah. And still it's now. It's back to St. Petersburg. Yeah, well, and uh, just to add something that just was coming into New York Times today, Vladimir Putin is asking you know that the Volgograd name be changed into Stalingrad again because he's putting this on referendum you know in my mind you know as bad Stalin was you know he deserves the name of that town because they broke the back of he the fascist really there, yes. changed the tide of the war yes he does yes the more Leninist, the early Bolshevik idealism that uh, was involved in the lower areas of the revolution changed the more widespread uh, Stalinist cynicism. When do you feel that the Russian people began to give up hope that there was really an idea left in the Russian revolution? Well, one of the things that happens is a lot of the people, early Bolsheviks, are idealists. They're all, you know, they're not all villains. And so you have Lenin and the people around and say, we're achieving an entirely new world. We're going to make a new man, a homo sovieticus. Uh, environment is what makes the man. And we're going to change things so much, you're going to realize all your full potential under this. So they'd say, well, you know, you have to get grain from the peasants. And you, oh, this is, you, you have to shut your heart to pity. What you're doing is historical necessity. If we don't get this grain and we can't feed the army or we can't feed the workers, the revolution is going to collapse. This is regrettable, but it's only temporary. Uh, the majority of people, uh, with the people we're talking about, they're up at the top. The majority of people in Russia are just trying to put bread on the table. And uh, that, that got to be harder and harder. And the thing about the terror that's so terrible is it was... Uh, done with randomness. You didn't necessarily have to be an enemy of the regime to get picked up and brought in and put in a camp or shot. So people sort of lost uh, their balance because of that. So what you do is you get down, you go below radar as much as possible. And that probably starts, ooh, it starts in Leningrad probably 1922-23 already. So it's more around the time of the Red Terror didn't even take to the, for the beginnings of World War II, Operation Barbarossa for that to start. Well, what happens is uh, 
th this is one of the interesting things about Stalin's terror. Uh, say, somebody would be picked up, somebody who's a party member who is Jewish, let's say. He would be brought in, and he said, you've been charged, you're a German spy. I mean, this is how ridiculous things were. You know, uh, here's a Jewish guy who's a German spy. This is Hitler, anti-Semitism, all that. And they would torture the person, have a trial sometimes, and you get up and go, yes, I'm a German spy. Then he would be taken out and shot. And uh, that's done on a large scale under Stalin. He liquidates all the old Bolsheviks just about. Very few of them survive. And one of the things he does is he also uh, touches up history. One of the, if you ever look at photographs, there's, uh, you'll see a photograph of Stalin with three people. He's walking along a riverbank. You see the same photograph, it's been touched up, there were two people. And eventually you see the photograph that Stalin walking by himself. And the reason for that is those three people are no longer walking on the earth. He does that and there's also a famous picture of Lenin getting off the train at Finland Station. And he's getting off the train, he's almost on the platform, and who's standing behind him? Stalin. Stalin wasn't there. St Stalin, interestingly, was one of the few Bolsheviks who was still in Russia. Everybody else was in exile in Western Europe. And when the provisional government took over, they granted an amnesty to everybody in Siberia. So Stalin and Kamenev were both, they were cabin mates in Siberia. They came back. Uh, so you have that. Then you have uh, ethnic minorities get purged. Um, just before the war, like uh, Latvians and Finns who lived in Leningrad, they were taken out. Poles who lived in the western part of Russia. Uh, then after the war, uh, there's a big purge of Jews. You have uh, uh, Golda Meir is the first Israeli ambassador to uh, the Soviet Union. And um, she shows up in a Moscow synagogue for Rosh Hashanah. And a big crowd of people meet her outside, Jews, and they're cheering, invoking the run. First thing Stalin thinks is, ah, an outside force. So he starts a campaign against the Jews. And uh, just before he died, he was putting into works what is known as the doctor's plot. And he was going to purge the medical profession. People were in the Kremlin and whatnot. And he died before that could be implemented. But uh, and he also, um, for example, in 1939, there's a pact between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. And they divide Poland along the River Bug. The eastern side of Poland falls to the Soviet Union, the western side to the Germans. Uh, a number of Polish officers happen to be on the eastern side. And the Russians say, surrender, we're fellow Slavs, we're going to fight the Nazis together. So these people all surrender, they're put into camps, and then they're taken out in a place called Katyn in uh, Belarus. They're taken into the woods, and they're all shot in the back of the head and buried in mass graves. And one of the reasons they did that was these were people who were middle class, they were professionals, they were university professors, doctors, lawyers, judges, and uh, they were the backbone of a free Poland. And he was planning to take over Poland, so why have opposition? Here I have an opportunity to get rid of it. Things like this went on and on and on. It was called liquidation. Liquidation. And give you a good example. Uh, in the United States, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were arrested and prosecuted as atomic spies. Chances are they would, the, the Soviets let them get captured because there were people who were really deep into providing the Soviets with information on our atomic bomb project. They all got away. So anyway, you have Julius Ethel Rosenberg. They're going to be sent to the electric chair. In Western Europe, has anybody here ever been to Paris? Yeah. You know, the Place de la Concorde? Yeah. yeah, it's a big circle. You can't cross it. You did. That would be packed with a couple of hundred thousand people protest protesting about the Rosenbergs and going, it's anti-Semitism, okay? While that's going on, Stalin has orchestrated trials in Hungary and in Czechoslovakia. And th th these are people who are in the Communist Party there. Most of them were Jews. Nobody said a word. They were taken out and liquidated. 
but everybody was looking at Julius and Ethel. Not that what happened to Julius and Ethel was right, but there should have been a protest about what Stalin was doing. He was very good like that. He knew how to maneuver and how to manipulate. And there we are. Yes? A uh, couple of things. Uh, you mentioned the, the sort of socialist tendencies, the welfare state, etc. And a lot of that has its roots in Kaiser Wilhelm's Prussia. Also, and I wonder if if there's a relationship there, if you could draw a relationship there. That's number one. A very good point. Let me just address okay. that. There was a crisis in, among socialists around the year 1900, 1900 up to 1914. One of Marx's predictions is the status of the working class is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. So you have a man by the name of Eduard Bernstein. He's a German. And he's not a revolutionary socialist, he's an evolutionary socialist. And he says, well, the franchise is widening, more and more people can vote. And the German worker has labor unions behind him. And he has the wherewithal, the economic and social and political wherewithal. He can get people elected to parliament and gradually they can adopt the socialist program. And for Lenin, this is anathema. You know, if, uh, if Lenin's whole thing is revolution, revolution is the pathway to the brave new world, and anything that detracts from that is bad. And so you have the um, social democrats in Europe, like th that, that's what they do, and what they do, and they're very clever, this is a good thing, I don't have to confiscate your property, I just tax you. So you take a country like Sweden, you know, the taxes is a graduated income tax, and if you're making above a certain level, a good part of your income goes in taxes, and that supports the welfare programs. Yeah, the second uh, thing is think about, you mentioned, you know, Stalin, evidently it was paranoid at this point in his uh, later years. That's a good way to and, and, yeah. and I look at the paranoia that our president has, along with the mentally, uh, the fact that he's mentally ill, clearly mentally ill, and I, this paranoia is very disturbing. And uh, with, I'm uh, thinking about the purges under Stalin, and I remember the movie Burnt by the Sun. Oh, I don't know whether very anybody good. here has seen oh, it. Oh, yes. But it was a very moving uh, movie, but I can't, I just recall seeing the, the soldier taken off at the end of the party, and I, re, I recall the can-can being played on the piano during the party, but I've forgotten the film. It was a long See part two. Film, but. See part two of Burnt by the Sun. It's really good. Oh, really? Yeah. What they do is, part one, the main character, the hero, who was a Soviet general, is shot. It's based on a real person who's shot. They mention that at the end of the movie. Part two, he's still alive and he's in a camp. And it's just as the Germans attack and he's able to escape. And it's about his adventures, the beginning of the war. There was a part. It's also a part three. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. All, all, all film? On film, yeah. yeah. And you want to see something good, another good thing, you ever see Moss Films. That's the main studio in uh, Moscow. Uh, um, if you go to uh, YouTube, they have a whole stock of mass film films you can watch. Because Soviet films, you know, see this is the interesting thing. Art is propaganda. And they did that very, very well. You don't want something where everybody in the room say, well, my opinion is this and my opinion is that. They take a hammer and they hit you on the head. When you see a film, there's a message, there's a theme. And even the dumbest person in the room can pick it up and understand it. And Stalin used to, but that was another thing, Stalin would go over scripts with people and everything like that, like, um, uh, did you ever see uh, Ivan the Terrible? Yeah. Uh, he, um, he criticized that, he, because that was one of his heroes. Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great were his two heroes. And he didn't think uh, Ivan got full credit. He used to have a, a group of men, when Ivan took the throne, uh, he was opposed by the boyars. These would be the nobles. And uh, he formed this group uh, of men, and they would ride on horseback, and they would have a broom with a wolf's head mounted on the top. And the broom stood for the fact they were going to sweep away all opposition. 
and he broke the back of the Boyer's opposition. And Stalin liked that. He was a man after his own heart. Can you comment on the new economic policy that was in effect in the 20s? Okay. What happens is Lenin, you, you, the story you always hear is Lenin was a pragmatist and he realized his policies weren't working, so he adopted the new economic policy. Ain't so. What happened was you had these expeditions going out, seizing grain from the peasants. Uh, in factories, you know, you had the bureaucracy was stifling everybody, there wasn't enough food. So you had a total wave of unrest engulfed the entire Soviet Union. You had army units deserting, army units mutinying. You had the sailors in Kronstadt. And uh, Lenin said the sailors in Kronstadt are picked. That turned on a light. And he realized that he'd gone too far. And at that point, he made the remark, there's no working class in Russia. And one of his uh, accomplices, or one of the people who was with him said, in that case, we're the vanguard of nothing. Because <laughs> the, so the, you know, the Communist Party is the vanguard of the working class. They're knocking everybody else the working class to get through. So anyway, uh, he has to stop the requisitioning of food. He tells the peasants, you can plant food again, you can pay a tax in kind, in food, in grain, but you're allowed to keep so much for yourself and everything like that. He does the same thing with the factories. Uh, then what he does, when the new economic policy is coming in, he also hardens up party discipline. There'll be no disputes within the party. Everybody follows the general line. That's a term for whatever the party thinks today. And that comes down from the Central Committee, from Lenin. And uh, he expelled, at that time, you still had people who were socialist revolutionaries. Some of them were allies of the Bolsheviks. And Lenin makes the remark, the only place I want to see a social revo socialist revolutionary is behind bars with a white guard on each side of them. So he breaks the back of the socialist revolutionaries at that time. They're all imprisoned, or some people are actually expelled from Russia. Like Julius Martov, who uh, was one of who helped found the Socialist Democratic Party with Lenin originally, went to a conference in Germany. He tried to get back into Russia. They said you can't come in. So he spent the last three years of his life. He was very sick at that time in Germany. But anyway, so he liberalizes things in the countryside. And he sort of liberalizes things in the factory. Uh, but that's only going to be a temporary measure. But he dies in 1924. Lenin was only 53 years old when he died. You look at pictures of him, he looks like he's a much older man. And I think the stress of the job, one of the things about Lenin, like you have Marx, Das Kapital, and you have reality, you have real people. So what do you do if there's a contradiction? You smash and you beat the people because Das Kapital is correct. And if you disagreed with him, he would froth at the mouth, he would yell and scream. His wife, Krutskaya, mentions like he would wake up in the middle of the night screaming, you know, anti-party people can't get away with this, and just shh, shh, go back to sleep. So uh, Stalin then comes along, and uh, he goes back to the old policies grabbing grain from the peasants. And one of the things that happens, this is also interesting, has to do with our area. Um, the peasants kill a good part of their livestock rather than go into collective farms, okay? So you now have a problem with the Soviet diet, protein. Where are you gonna get protein from? So somebody says fish. So that's why you used to have these gigantic fleets from Russia and Eastern Bloc off Long Island. We'd have these big schools of fish, they'd start up in Nova Scotia and extend all the way down to Virginia. They'd be fishing for them. The supply of protein in the diet back home. As you were talking about uh, the Rosenbergs and what was going on in Eastern Europe, I'm thinking about the diversionary tactics there, and I'm thinking at the same time of Trump's diversionary tactics here, that you that you see what he wants you to see. Oh my like, God, Trump is an amateur. I don't know how anybody can get upset. That he's an amateur and an ignoramus. Well, he that's another story. But I'm saying the, <laughs> that that there's this whole one that we're having diversionary t um, tactics used here, so we don't see the larger picture. 
and that's where I'm going. Most people don't see the larger picture. That's one of the problems. Very few people. Oh. Okay. 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 Okay.
Moscovy. That's the original nucleus of Russia. It's looked upon as the third Rome. They're the heirs of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, falls to the Turks in 1453. A niece of the last emperor, Manuel II Palaeologus, Sophia Palaeologus, marries the Tsar. And uh, there are monks who come from Byzantium. They come to uh, Russia. And uh, they develop the theory that the Tsar is God's anointed. And if you rebel against the Tsar, that's blasphemy. No Byzantine emperor ever said that. This is something that starts in Russia. So he is an autocrat. This is a man who does not have to listen to anybody. And he has an excuse, too, because Russia, the ethnic makeup of the Russian Empire was incredible. You have 400 languages spoken, so you have at least 100 ethnic groups. Uh, take uh, Azerbaijan, Baku. There was a outbreak there around 1907. 2,000 people were killed in the fighting. That was between Azerbaijanis and Armenians. You have the Poles, who are not very happy being in the Russian Empire. They revolt a couple of times. Then you have pogroms against the Jews, uh, 193 and 4, Kishinev, and places like that. Uh, it's a very, very loose society. There's a strike in um, Moscow in uh, 1907, and the authorities were afraid to bring in the army. They thought the army would mutiny, so they used artillery, and a thousand people were killed. And the area, the, the district of Moscow, where this thing took place, was leveled. Uh, things like this were very good. So the Tsar would say, if I wasn't here, it would even be worse. And he also said, if we had an elected assembly, it would be mostly socialists and liberals. And they would stymie every way possible so nothing would be done. So it's better off leaving me alone with everything. And unfortunately, the last couple of Tsars were very, very incompetent. And they lost a lot of prestige because of the wars that they were in that they lost. That really hurt. Nicholas became king. Tsar. I thought he was Tsar and then he became king. No, Tsar is better than king. The king I, thought, I thought he was Russian. Russian never had king. No, I thought he was Tsar of all the Russians. I'm sorry. I thought he was. I thought he was. Better, this is better than being a king. Um, is, it, is, it, is a Russian. And what he did is also. Here's, here's an example of one of the things he was able to do. In 1905, a survey was taken of the bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church, like roughly 350 bishops, did this survey. And uh, the authorities were astounded. They were flabbergasted. They thought these people were very docile and supine. They had all sorts of reforms they wanted done. And one of the things I wanted done is in, 19, in 1721, Peter the Great abolished the Patriarchate of Moscow. And he established a holy synod that was run by a procurator, a layman. A couple of bishops would meet, and this layman would be there, and he'd say, okay, here's the agenda for today. And they'd have to meekly agree. And if anybody disagreed, they'd be exiled to a monastery. So anyway, the bishops go, we want a patriarch again. This is sent to the czar, and the czar says, oh, I'll have to think about this. And he comes out and he says, well, this will be another power source. This will be a, a, an adversary, a rival. So it's just shelved. It's not done. Everything is in his hands, and he's incompetent. And that's one of the reasons, like, uh, you have all these students joining these radical movements. There was no other outlet for discontent. But he was uh, powerful. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, up until maybe about 1902, 1903, the entire, uh, what do you call it, uh, the budget, the budget of the Russian Empire, came out of the Tsar's household. And there's a man by the name of Sergei Vita, W-I-T-T-E. He was a Russian of German extraction. He is the first person to come along and say, no, you need a regular budget. We need a national budget aside from your household budget. And how about we put the ruble on, on a gold standard? And he does a lot. And then he's followed shortly after that by Pietor Stolipin. And Stolipin gets the idea that what Russia needs is a prosperous peasantry. We want peasants to own their own land. 
and he starts a program. And eventually, there's a falling out between him and the Tsar. The Tsar doesn't like this. And uh, anyway, in 1903, I guess it was, three or four, he goes to the opera in Kiev, and he gets assassinated. And uh, that's it. That's the last hope of any kind of meaningful reform in Russia with his death before the revolution. So I'd like, I'd like to comment on some Russians I know, but I, I want to... You better be nice comments. <laughs> We're copying everything down. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked in industry and I worked in a company which did not require a security clearance and for some reason we collected a large number of Russian uh, scientists. And what they told me, they said some interesting things, but they, they were talking about the Russians in the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, you, you know, and what they were saying, first they said, uh, everybody is stealing something in Russia, and they told me tales of the black market, but, uh, but they also had gotten a free education, they had free rent, uh, well, one guy told me like how how he had to go about buying gasoline. There was you know you couldn't go to a gas station. You would go to some back road, and there would be a a truck there, an, an oil truck there, and it would load you up with gasoline. But the people managed to survive. They they were doing fairly well. I I thought you know from what they told me they were doing pretty well. And then I, then I think when the Soviet Union broke down. It, you know, it got much worse. But for a while, I don't know, when did, when, when did it start getting better in Russia? You know, was it after Stalin died? Or, oh, oh, you after know? Stalin died, definitely. But like, there was a quip that used to be made in Russia, the Eastern <coughs> Bloc. They pretend to pay us, and we pretend to work. Yeah. You, you know, like, uh, you'd go to buy shoes. Like, for example, Russia, at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia was the largest producer of steel in the world. And it was the largest producer of shoes. So what would happen now is like, you're paid uh, $20,000 a week. Here's your paycheck. Here's your money. You go to the store. There were no shoes. Uh, or whatever you were looking for, it, it was scarce. That was why you had the black market. And if it wasn't for the black market, there probably would have been another revolution. That's what kept people together. So the moral of the story is <laughs> change your underwear every day. <laughs> yes? I'm anyway. Well, Virginia and I were we in Moscow and St. Petersburg in 97. And like you said, too, the first thing was, do you have Bibles? Is so? Yeah, in 97. Were you in a church group? Yes, we were with the church group, yeah, and they wanted to know who we were bringing in, you know, Bibles. But, you know, we toured around all, you know, the outer cities, you know, and it was amazing. Like you say, factories. The people were getting paid, say like it was a jewelry uh, factory, they were getting paid with jewelry, and for them to buy food or get food, they had to sell what they got as their salary. This is in 97. The products that, that they made. They the had products that they made in the factories, they were given as their salary, and they had to turn around and try to sell it. Now, as tourists, and we did buy some, you know, the uh, enamel jewelry, which is very pretty, uh, you know, we bought it from the people, and they said, be careful because <laughs> if we go to border to go home, and they can take it from us. You know, there was a but religious... now, so how, how in the world can the, these people, who, like you say, survive? This is done, uh, this goes back to Lenin's time. They were doing the same thing in factories. Uh, whatever you, was made in a particular yes. factory, you would get a quantity of that, and you'd go out and you'd buy it. Um, but then, you, you know, you couldn't buy it with the tourists, because then we would, you know, if, if they were at, you know, to get out of the country, you know, uh, to get our passports back to get out. You know, they could take it from us. And, oh, and caviar, too, was a big yeah, thing, sure, you sure. know. And if they're hats. Oh, you want to go for a hat? Because of the American the Civil War, New York used to be the world's largest exporter of caviar. And, and uh, the shipment start, stopped because of Confederate raiders. And the Russians stepped in and replaced us. But anyway, what are we going to do? I guess the best index of their misery 
compared to us. Oh, in my book, is life expectancy of a Russian male is 65 years. Life expectancy of us in here is 76, 11 years longer. This is the ultimate index in my book. You know how they live much shorter. You know how they discovered that the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse? There were statistics, health statistics that had come out. And what they used to do is they used to lie egregiously. You know, you have 26% growth rate every year, all kind of stuff. Anyway, there were medical statistics came out. The CIA got them. They got the mobbers, the mobbers and statisticians started looking at them and saying, this is impossible. Life expectancy has dropped 10 years according to this. That can't happen in an industrialized society, but it has. An interesting anecdote related to Russia. I've never been there yet. I want to go. But our son and his best friend, after they graduated from college, they set up a little business uh, in Russia, importing optical equipment. Now, our son was studying business, and his best friend was into filming. So he knew a lot about optical equipment. And so they were importing Russian optical equipment. For example, for a film student who couldn't afford the really expensive equipment, he could buy pretty good Russian equipment, or serious filmmakers, professionals, buy one of them beta camera, shall we say, that would be used in a situation where it could be damaged or whatever. They had the business going. They were doing pretty well for about a year, and then they got into something else. But they did it legitimately, everything by the book. But in Russia, they found some fellows that were scalping Bolshoi tickets. <laughs> and they used them as their contacts there to work things out. And then, if they wanted the goods to move out of the country, they had to pay a bribe at the docks, or they would just sit there. And that was the way of doing business. And I had, uh, I taught English as a second language for a while, too. And we had a discussion there. It's perhaps a little unfair, but uh, the comments it made, but we had people from all over the world, mostly Asians, of the Asians at the time, uh, the majority of them were Korean, and then the next group was Japanese, but we had Brazilians and uh, uh, Taiwanese, of course, and uh, people from all over the world. But we teachers were talking one day, and we said, which of these students would you expect to be most likely to cheat? And we all agreed it was the Russians. And we think it's because of the system post-1989. Post-1917. So post post yeah. <laughs> but anyway, everything seemed to operate that way. And that uh, I caught a student cheating once in class. Uh, uh, again, it was a Russian. I couldn't imagine a Japanese student cheating, for example, but, but it was something just, I don't know, but it seemed the system had created it. There's different emigrations in Russia, for example. Uh, do you ever go to Glen Cove? Yeah, I used to live there for three, four years. Because that was settled originally by white Russians, and there's still a very large community of their descendants there. And uh, I know people who were, uh, whose families uh, came out of Russia in 1918, 1919, went to France, came to the United States, and they were always told, the kids were always told, they, they could speak Russian. You never speak to newcomers. You know, I, I think they used to think these people were Soviet spies. You spoke to them, you'd be compromised. I think it was a, you know, uh, paranoia, but that was the attitude. There was also some real hate, and justifiably so, because they felt that these new age Russians are Soviets. Yeah. The Soviets were the ones who took away their estates, who made them in, in, impoverished, who made them leave the country, the country that they loved so dearly. So, this is so, so I mean, it's it's very understandable when you get just a little bit into the into the mechanics of why yeah. you know how it worked with the several generations of, of Russian immigration waves. Because you know the uh, 
Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, mm -hmm. uh, they've canonized the Tsar and Tsarina and the yes. family. Yes. Yes. Good reason to. Well, they, they were strong political and ideological opponents. Oh, and definitely. Enemies of the Soviet Union. They're considered, yeah. Plus, there was also a huge, you know, between the several waves of immigration from Russia. Uh, there was this huge uh, 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 nationalistic side to it because the first wave of all of them, almost all of them were Russians, and many of them were Russian nobles, and, and those who were not nobles were just well to do people who could afford to escape. But the second wave, and especially the third wave, contained a lot of the Jews, and that was a no no for uh, 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 you know, like a, a Russian purebred. They did not associate with Jews. Talking about Russian Jews, it's interesting that I think one of the canards that's always mentioned is the Bolshevik Revolution was caused by Jews, the protocols of the elder well, society. Yeah, there's still a firm belief into, into that concept in the few in the generations that follow. The lady or the girl who tried to assassinate Lenin, mm -hmm. her name was Fanya Kaplan. Yes. She was Jewish. Yeah, everybody was Jewish. And the same day that she tried to assassinate Lenin. Somebody else assassinated the chief of the Cheka uh -huh. in Petrograd. He was also Jewish. Uh, the man who was Lenin's biggest opponent in the Social Democrats, who said, you have to have democracy. What you're doing is wrong. You're going to create a despotism. He was Jewish. That's, uh, uh, what's the name? You know, uh, Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand. She was Jewish from a family who fled the Bolsheviks. She was no, she was Jewish. Now, what I'm getting at is it's a little more complicated. Oh, it's very, very, very complicated. There, there, are a lot of, there were a lot of Jews in Lenin's government and higher echelons, but there were also a lot who were opposed to him. And the typical person on the street didn't carry the way. The typical Jew in the pale was probably just trying to get bread on the table and avoid getting killed by a pogrom in the Civil War. And it, politics had nothing to do with his life. Torovici, that's it. 